questions from Roger uh, Paget. What's up, Roger? How's it going, buddy? He says, Paul, how many donuts did you eat? Five donuts. Five donuts while squat squatting four or five for a total of 20 reps. I hate right? that happens. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Um, Eric Olson. What's up, Eric? Uh, how many hours after eating a meal? Uh, my dad's on, too. What's up, Dad? Uh, how many hours after eating a meal to pass... Um, to be in a fasted state. Well, I mean, you know, I would say probably a couple hours, like three hours after a meal, you're in a fasted state. You know what I mean? What if you look at like blood <clears throat> glucose? Because we know blood glucose goes from about back to baseline after about three hours. Yeah. So, so if we use glucose, like Andy's saying, as a metrics, I say around three hours, you're really talking about being in a fasted state. So, like, for example, if you are doing a 15 hour fast, really, you're fasting for about 12 of those. Um, so, good question. Should I do front squats in the same day I do back squats? I, I think it's a, you know what, I think it's a good t technique. I mean, doing front squats the same day as back squats is just fine. You can also switch it up and just focus one on the other. I'd say both. Does creatine, this is Billy, Billy P, uh, Pearson. Um, by the way, if you guys are on Facebook, make sure you share this as much as possible. Um, <clears throat> does creatine have to be taken in one dose or can I dissolve it in two liters of water and drink it over a period of a few hours? To be quite honest with you, I would like, um, you know, when we say creatine in, in, in one dose, I'm assuming you mean like five grams. Yeah. I would just drink the five grams, to be honest, Billy. It, you know? It wouldn't qualify for anything. Else. Yeah, no, I would just, you know what I mean? Um, what do you think about working out during, uh, and also creatine's not like super stable and, and fluid to either. No, if, if you actually look at some of the labels, it says, Stir and drink immediately. Yeah. Shake vigorously yeah. or something. It's not super stable. In fact, my friend Dr. Ralph Yeager actually he spent his whole like postdoc. He's a chemist, literally trying to figure out how to make creatine stable and fluid, and it didn't happen. So I would drink it. Uh, what do you, this is Chung? What's up, Chung? Uh, what do you think about working out during a fasting period, Chung? I think um, that that's fine. But typically, if you're trying to gain muscle, you want to try and eat after. Animals 12, 4, 5, 6 says, uh, do you like hockey? Dude, we just had some Tampa Lightning players in here today. We love the, we love I know hockey. Still, yeah. Like, love it. So who's a Penguins fan? <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I'm from PA. And the Penguins are crushing it right now. They are. Yeah, so, they are, they are. Just, saying, just saying. You know, I'll tell you, I, tell you, I, I, love, I, I love the Penguins. They have a lot of tradition. Yeah. You had Mario Lemieux, uh, you know, Yarmy Yarger. I mean, just like um, a lot of really good tradition. So, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely, I like the Penguins. Um, <clears throat> just Joey C says, just looking for any tips in regards to hitting the rear delts for that wide look, that wide, nice look, right, that we all, we all want. Um, well, basically, again, the rear delts, the biggest thing about them is that they are going to move your arms backward, right? So... A couple things that you can do is like obviously you're gonna try you're gonna want to try and like rotate your arms back that's gonna hit the rear delt so you know bent over laterals standing cable reverse laterals reverse pec deck um, and if you're trying to go heavy you can do bent over laterals but try and row up toward your neck I think that's a really good one or superset rowing up to the neck with uh, reverse chest flies like we talked about last time how important is it in order to actually activate your rear delts is weight overall not to overactivate it and start using your back instead of your rear delts yeah it's i think rear delts. delts are because they're such a small muscle group i think that's where mind muscle connection becomes very very important is on the because you could make you could make like a back exercise really a rear delt exercise yeah yep exactly right you know what i mean like a lap pull down exactly just Exactly. You can even do like what Andy says, you do lap pull downs. As long as you're getting like horizontal, you know, th this horizontal movement, that would be cool. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, someone says, Herb Olson says, how do we can, what's up? First of all, it's a cool name. What's up, Herb? Um, so, how do we convince people who listen to bodybuilders to start listening to educated individuals in the field instead? Well, I'll tell you what, that's a really good question. Basically, I like to think of it as like, you can go dichotomous, like either or, or you can do what we do at Applied Science Performance Institute and kind of bridge the gap between the two. So I think it's really like, 
you go try and convince people that like there's this science, but then there's the, the, the application and bodybuilders have a lot of that application. Scientists oftentimes have a lot of the science. The problem is I think it's really convincing the scientists to talk English. That's why, you know, <clears throat> and to stop hating on people who aren't scientists. Like that's, that's my biggest thing. I think that's where we can help people. So there's a lot of, there's, there's people who are quote scientists out there who will go out and call people who aren't scientists zealots, you know what I mean? Who aren't scientists dumb. And I'm like, that's, that's not, you know, I don't get the point. Why? Like, what's the point of that? So just because I'm a, just because I have a doctorate doesn't make me any better than anyone else. It just means I have an expertise at this topic. So I'm, I think that to do that, it's guys like me, guys like Andy, guys like Paul talking English and spreading the word, you know, in, in a palatable manner and not downing people who don't know science. And then basically like guys who are on here, like on Facebook over here, hitting share and then sharing that information with everyone else. So I think that would be anything else you guys want to add to that? Yeah, like scientists, don't be you know what. Like the you know the issue comes in when the information it becomes so complex nobody actually wants to read it. Simple as that. Exactly right. Like you know that's my point. Like scientists are just normal people, act like normal, talk English. Um, if a muscle is fifty percent fast and fifty percent slow twitch fibers. And daily work at a six to eight rep range, does it mean that half of that muscle is undertrained? You know, Zoran, I, that's a good question. I, I think, yeah, to be quite honest, yeah. I think you're still, a lot of people are arguing and go, oh, you still hit the slow twitch. I'm not saying you don't, but I don't think you optimize f slow twitch hypertrophy in a six to eight repetition range. So you're gonna hit them, you're gonna hit them in supersets, giant sets, 20 rep sets, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, I think so, Zoran. Um, Dan Cohen 247. What's up, Dan Cohen 247? He says, What's your scientific back backing for intermittent fasting? How quickly would you see results if you engage in that program? That's it, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, there's a lot. Of, so, uh, Dan, to answer your question, definitely fall uh, muscle PhD for the next two weeks. All of our infographics are going to be centered around intermittent fasting. So, we'll actually present what evidence is out there. Um, you know, there's some, there's evidence out there. You know, it's not definitive, but there's definitely a lot of evidence out there that demonstrates that intermittent fasting can certainly be beneficial. How quickly you respond depends on you. You know what I'm saying? So if you got someone who hasn't dieted a lot, they do intermittent fasting, they might get really lean, really fat. If you have someone who's a, a, a bodybuilder or, or, or a bikini athlete, they've been dieting for years, maybe it helps a little bit, right? All depends on you, right? For me, it's harder. Is, you know, but it's still a technique that I notice. Zach Shutters says, if I do intermittent fasting, is it bad to work out at 5 a.m. and not to have my first meal till noon? If you're doing cardio, it's probably not the worst thing. Um, if you're going to, if you're trying to build muscle, probably not the best idea, I would say. So you're probably gonna do like a modified intermittent fast. Um, the real fresh, what's up the real fresh says does fat after a workout blunt your glycemic response yes Eric Olson how many hours after eating a meal needs to pass to be in a fasted state a oh we said that yeah did. so uh, three hours after pal For some reason, it's not, it's not picking up my pin. okay um, <clears throat> all right let's see um, so will I do your time or attention or, or whatever I think it like got backed up. Okay, um, we just go on that. We'll, yeah, okay, okay, we got one. What motivated you to get a PhD and specifically in your field? I'm at a crossroads. Antonio, hello. This is a really good question. You know, I get a lot, really good question. A lot of people have actually been asking me, like, how do you get in, how did you get into your field? I, I'm really interested in doing what you're doing. First off, that's an honor to me that you would say that. I really appreciate that. And I understand what it is to be at a crossroads. Um, so what motivated me to get my PhD? Well, my dad, I think I saw my dad was on here watching. Honestly, it's my dad, Floyd Wilson. Um, since I was a kid, uh, you know, I mean, ever since I, you know, could talk, my dad emphasized education. So for me, it was basically just like, I, 
always knew education was very, very important. My dad always stressed the importance of education. He worked, I don't know how many j jobs to give us an education and sacrifice so we can have education, but he always said, like, son, it gives you versatility, okay? Now, I always knew I either wanted to be, like, you know, a pro athlete or a scientist, so. Uh, <laughs> One didn't work out. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly right. So, but, um, you know, I, I had, a, you know, school, it's like anything else. There's genetic component to things as well. And like, it's like, if you're, if you excel at basketball or whatever, if you are really good at school, I could be a jock and I excelled at school. You know I mean? I, I, you know, I could show up to the exam uh, at a doctoral level course and just ace it. I don't know. That's just, I was blessed. My dad's smart guy. My mom's smart. So, but anyway, um, what motivated me was to change lives. My dad always said that education could be used as a tool to change lives. Um, so that's why I went to get my PhD. Also to be a scientist, you know, having an upper level, yeah, uh, uh, having an upper level degree could be beneficial. Actually, you're in our conference room right now. So we can actually show it. Like if you look at the, this up here, it says changing lives through science and innovation. <clears throat> so that's the other thing is my dad was always future oriented which spells out innovation right so innovation was very very important and so studying how to be innovative through school is very, very important now I want to emphasize something to you how much did I really learn through school of what I currently know 10% be quite honest with you 10% if you think getting a doctorate is like say you want to like be in my field and you like I, you know I want to have an ASPI maybe you will maybe one of you guys watching this because ASPI is going to go global I don't care where you are we're going global maybe one of you listening to this will run an ASPI one day I don't know say you I want to run, I want my own ASPI I want to run it okay school's not going to give that to you it's not it's not thinking thinking outside of the box is going to give that to you like studying outside is you know like even like today like first thing when I walked into the facility Andy's like did you see this paper okay first thing he said to me right um, and I said I haven't seen that you, you sent it to me text it to me my point is that like you don't learn that in textbooks you're having to constantly study okay so you're then the second thing is you're gonna have to co constantly apply things right what most people don't know is I have a background in psychology learning psychology and the best way to learn is internships and experience, right? So, like, to be quite honest, maybe one of you guys ends out interning here. There's a girl, Dasha, who's here, actually. It's her second day of her internship. She started by being on Muscle PhD Academy, following us. She asked questions on here. She reached out. Now she's in here, and she's going to be doing some, like, molecular analysis and some, you know, some cool stuff with us. She has a certain skill set, right? But that's how I, I learned is experience. When I was when I was like an undergraduate, I literally went in to professor's office. His name is Dr. Sawyer. These guys know they've heard about Dr. Sawyer a million times. And I said, Dr. Sawyer, I want to do research. Like, I I just said I don't care if I need to go to Starbucks and bring you a coffee every single day. If that's my contribution to research, I got in his lab. I learned. I picked his brain, and that's how I did it. So you've got to study constantly. And the other thing is you got to think outside of the box and you got to realize that what people say about a study is not the study, okay? So if someone, if someone says, or a scientist writes a discussion, that's, the, um, that's their opinion. That's not the data, right? So that, I guess that's my uh, advice overall. Here at Aspie, we come from very diverse backgrounds. Everybody's different, everyone's specific in their own field. Now, whenever we do bring up a study like that, how much does it mean that everybody has their own differing opinion on that specific study and do you learn a large amount just from that contribution as well? 100%. So that's the other thing is I'm very open. There's a lot of times where people have literally come on our comments and said something that would be construed as mean. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I've responded and say, you know what, I appreciate your opinion. Thanks for giving me you know, your insight on that, right? Now, I think the bottom line is that Andy might have a different opinion than I have. Paul might have a different opinion than I am, but that's what makes us grow. See, your value systems will make you grow and learn. A lot of people have value systems like, uh, that basically uh, their value system says being right is a value to them. So they'll come up and down people and say, 
you people who don't agree with me, you're zealots, even though I sent you a bunch of studies, you know, hating on them. Instead, you just step back and go, you know what? I don't have to be right, right? I just want to know the truth. That person's opinion might provide insight that I don't have. What is it? Can you explain further, right? And that's the other way I've learned. Like, I literally will learn. Like, when I was teaching at university, I learned from people who are undergraduates. They go, oh, you know, it's an interesting opinion. I haven't quite heard it that way before. Tell me more. So you're telling me it's more than black and white. It's more than black and white. It's more than black and white. And studies are limited. They're not definitive. They're limited. So that's it. Um, Alan, uh, is it Alan? Yeah, Alan. What's up, Alan? It says, hey, Doc, can you give a great example of a good full body routine and consist to, to consistently grow and simulate how often should you train if you're doing a full body? And I, I know you're, you're thinking, right? What are you thinking? Yeah, well, because he's going to because it give an example of a good full body routine, or you know, at least for a full training routine. I say go to Project Mass. Ah, oh, yeah, that's right. Check out Project Mass. You know, we did it. We did a we did Project Mass a few years ago. It's on bodybuilding.com. If you don't have a job or have nothing else to do, and the gym's your only thing, then yeah, do Project <laughs> Mass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but I mean, that's I think going to give you a, a good insight, Alan. And I think you know what we're actually putting up more workouts. We're doing workout of the week. Um, and maybe one of these weeks triceps. we'll put up a full body. Gotcha. This week's triceps, check it out, right? Brutal. It's going to be brutal. Um, yeah. Um, oh, another good full body workout we did was um, actually our HMB study, to be honest. If you go to ResearchGate and look up the HMB study, I'd do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, someone says apple cider vinegar, drink it. There's a lot of studies that show you actually lose body fat with it. It's funny because, like, I know, I think my dad's still watching, but, like, my dad was, like, my dad's all about, like, super healthy. And um, when I was a kid, you know, he'd, you know, he'd have a bunch of stuff, supplements and stuff like that. And one of the things he had was apple cider. I'm like, come on, dad. Apple, I don't want to drink. Come on. You know, that's, that's like mumbo jump. That's like, you know, uh, you know, whatever. It's a potion. That's not, like, science. So he's. I'm gonna get a call from my dad tonight and go. Oh, I was right on, on on apple cider vinegar. So yeah, you were right, Dad. There's good studies on it. So <laughs> why does apple cider vinegar do that? So apple. There's a lot of different reasons, but one is that it potentially improves insulin sensitivity. And I think apple cider vinegar is a good like insulin sensitizing agent overall. What do you think? Um, there's been some. I've I've seen some stuff that it actually improves the 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 gut microbiome ah uh, good gut call microbiome. actually dasha just offered a lot of good insight on the gut microbiome good I'm call tell you after this. good call um so we yeah. need to do like a whole week on or a couple weeks on the, the gut microbiome but yeah andy brings up a good point there's a lot that it potentially that apple cider vinegar actually improves gut microbiome which there's a lot of good bacteria flora that will improve insulin sensitivity that improve fat loss so yeah overall uh i would definitely use it and yeah dad you're right <laughs> uh, J.R. Batista 81 says, any news about growing tiny calves? Um, love your work. Are we going to do calves soon? Or do uh, we already do calves? Three weeks. Three weeks, we're doing calves. Three weeks. Um, oh, look, he goes, I love your work. I was in your lecture here in Brazil. Looking forward to being in Tampa and knowing about ASPI. First off, J.R. Batista 81, that's freaking awesome. It was great meeting you in Brazil. Um, it was phenomenal. Uh, I'm going to give you, this is my piece of advice to you. Train your calves every single day. Be honest. Yep. Train your calves every single day. Hit the front of your calves every day. So I do like standing calf raises every day. Next day, like seat it to hit the soleus. Next day, anterior calves to do the front of the calves. And then reach back down and rotate. You know? like a nice finisher. <clears throat> exactly. I got it, dude. I got to hit. Oh, I, I got a good calf workout. <laughs> your, calves never, your calves are huge. Calves are huge. <laughs> you should bring Thanks. something in here while we're doing these lives. Thanks, <laughs> I appreciate it. Workout. I appreciate it. Uh, okay, uh, Q Lark says, do peak ATP supplements really work? I think they do. And will it benefit hypertrophy? Greetings from Netherlands. Wow, I actually want to go to the Netherlands. Um, <clears throat> so peak ATP works when you do, meaning that it works very underneath high volume high fatigue exercise with short rest period lengths. So if you're a power lifter, probably not so much. Um, who's that guy? Says, uh, um, I, mean, I want to read him. Just for, I'm a huge fan of your work, uh, Adrian. Thanks, buddy. I'm a huge fan of you. 
I've read some of your papers at ResearchGate. In the future, I want to be like you. Dude, that, this is Adrian bon, Bonilla, dude. You know that? Do you understand what that means to me? Motivated, accomplishment, of the, we're done. That's no, dude. That, you know what that means to me? Like Adrian, I appreciate, man. I want to be like you, brother. Anytime you're in Tampa, come out here, show you around. Love you, man. Um, uh, and you know what? You can be better than I am, man. Just keep doing what you're doing. You got a head start, um, and uh, you're gonna change the world. Change the world. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Apostolus Michael says. Um, I thought it was like, I almost read apoptosis for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Apostolos Michael says, if protein synthesis maximizes at 20 grams, so what happens with the other grams if I do, do intermittent fasting, 70 grams of protein per meal? Do I use, okay. <clears throat> Here's the thing. I don't think protein synthesis is maximized at 20 grams. I think that's with a small sample size of like six people where statistically you're not going to see a difference. I think it's more maximized around 40 or 50 grams. So with the other amount, there's other benefits to protein besides muscle growth. For one, it's hard to store protein. So you're not going to manage to store it as fat. That's another thing is it can have a high thermic effect. You know, it could increase calorie expenditure. There's other benefits. But go ahead. Um, I would throw a note in there. What the function of protein, not just for building muscle. What does protein do? Well, everything. 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 Hair, skin, nails, thaw, you know, everything. Receptors, enzymes. Yeah. enzymes. It's not just muscle, right? So if you're telling me I eat too much, what will happen? Well, How much protein? Well, I think some of it potentially. I don't. Basically, if you're eating like 50 grams, like I think 70 grams are quite a lot. I don't need it. You know, you need to eat 70 grams. That's a lot in a meal. What's going to happen is probably a lot of it will get converted over to glucose at that point. So utilize it as energy. If it's like past 50 grams, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, so. Yeah, I think that it'll just get converted and utilize energy. Very hard to store as fat. Ladder 5 Fitness says, as a hard gainer, is it better to not do cardio or add hit? Add hit. Not doing cardio is not a good thing. You need to be in shape to train. Near Ohan, uh, um, Ohayan says, what's up? Hey, Doc, what do you think about uh, EMS training, like electro electrical stimulation training? Um... Basically, uh, I think it's great. I think it works. Check out Generation Iron 2. You'll see myself, Terrence Ruffin, uh, Santi, um, Anita Herbert, uh, basically uh, using electrostimulation. Basically, you stimulate the muscle so when you're lowering the weight, um, you're, it's contracting at the same time. So you're causing a lot of micro tearing on the way down. And I think it's actually one of the biggest growth techniques that are out there. Uh, yeah. Antonio says, how many research articles per day do you read? You know, how important do you think that is? How important actually? I think that is? Um, I think it's very important. Um, at my best, you know, if like you're saying, because like I said, here's the thing, you got to understand, like, you got to go to my peak research days when I was publishing at sometimes two to three papers a month. Like, uh, you know, that's when I would have equivalent on research, I'd be on the Mr. Olympia stage, right? <laughs> and like I was publishing literally, I was one of the most prolific scientists in the world, to be honest with you. In my field, at my peak on research, one of the most prolific scientists in the world, publishing two to three papers a, a month, doing, you know, probably 30 experiments a year. At that time, I might have been reading on average probably 12 papers a day. Um, some days when I was in my PhD, when I was doing my PhD, um, I think I had my intellectual peak when I had to, you had to take these exams that were called qualifying exams. And at that point, basically you have a room, like there's a conference room, you have a room full of my whole committee, so several PhDs, right? And essentially what you would have is they'd all ask you questions for basically three hours straight, and sometimes longer, maybe even longer, and that was your exam. You had to basically, no matter what they said, skeletal muscle, anything they could hit you on doesn't matter what it was and the first question they asked me like started off i walked in they're like take me through the process from <clears throat> resistance training to skeletal muscle damage that gets incurred to remodeling of that tissue all the way up to hypertrophy step by step i want to know the cytokines that are involved in that process i want to know what molecular pathways are involved in that process and by the way be thorough 
I'm like, okay, yeah, good morning to you too. <laughs> so at that time, I could have been reading 30 papers a day. Quick side note, how important is it to go further than the abstract? Very oh. important. So so basically, you had to delve into the paper, go into the abstract, and don't go, like, don't, like, I'm listen, I'm telling you information, but go read the paper, right? So uh, I'm human, guys, you know, and so um, I, I err. And so that's the bottom line is that scientists are human. They err. Read the paper. Get into the details of the paper. I think that's very important. So, Antonio, I would advise at least reading one paper a day. So no matter what happens, I read at least one research paper a day. Um, I usually wake up every morning and read. Um, you know, I'll go for a walk and I'll read for about an hour to start my day, right? So that, that that's at minimum. Uh, so... Um, but right now we're working so much on this Muscle PhD Academy course that's <laughs> going to be released dozen. that we got to read at least a dozen today. Okay, Matt McGuire. So are we doing this fast now? No, just hit that one. Then we'll go oh, fast. Matt McGuire says, are BCAs worth taking if consuming adequate protein? I think so. I don't think you go wrong with taking BCAs. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of scientists go through, it doesn't matter. Whatever. They're anabolic. Take them. Steve, uh, is this quick? Now we're going. Yeah, okay, guys, these are rapid fire, so I'm not going to go into as much detail. I won't tell any stories. It's going to be closer to yes or no. Steve Hop says, "Hi, Doc. I'm a 48 year old male. You're still young, Steve. In the gym five days a week and on keto. I train around 8 p.m. every night, and then I'm in bed for 11 at 11 p.m. Will this hamper a fat loss? Um, what time do you get up? No, I don't think so. As long as you get like get like at least seven eight hours of sleep, but um, uh, no. <clears throat> um, does intermittent fasting, that's Carson says, does intermittent fasting have significant fat loss rather to a, a regular diet if same calories? I think you'll have a small amount of uh, in, improved fat loss. I think, uh, yes. Uh, you don't have to read less out this almost. Just calories, I'm, I'm going on the record of this, calories are one thing. And they're a major contributor to fat loss. Maybe the number one, but they're not everything. Period. I think you forgot the rapid fire idea. I'm kidding. Okay, right, right, right. No, <laughs> thank you. Paul keeps me in line. Eric Olson, is there any benefit to alternating muscle groups during our workout? Chest, shoulders um, versus doing all. Yes, you'll have higher volume, Eric, uh, Eric, that way, and a more efficient workout. Simply, how to improve bloating? Uh, how do I improve bloating? Um, basically, water. Um, look at the foods Reduce. that are causing uh, um, bloating. So, you need to take a journal. Certain foods you may react to cause uh, um, um, bloating. Uh, Aaron Richter. Oh, is that what happened? What did Aaron say? Oh, okay. when hitting a two a day strength in the morning and hit workouts in the evening, would creatine be best post morning or evening workout? Um, you know what? I would do the CrossFit, do it post evening, or take it both workouts. To be quite honest, um, Jaime Perez Gonzalez says, um, Agmatine or citrulline, both. Um, good stack. Hi, Doc. Would you still recommend some forms of calorie cycle and an aggressive mini cut? Yes. Um, what are your thoughts on one or two alcoholic beverages a day instead of the same calories from fat and carbs? I think a glass of wine a couple times a week is super beneficial. Be honest with you. I need to have one tonight. <laughs> um, Hugo Alejandro uh, Har Harmio says, How far apart should one perform hit? and or steady state cardio from a weight training at least 12 hours if it's the lower body. Um, okay, I have a degree in nutrition. Awesome, congratulations. Um, and another one in culinary arts. Boom, that's freaking awesome, right? Where'd you go to school? Yeah, where'd you go to school? Oh, uh, God. I wanna go for a master soon. What goal do you recommend would be a good, uh, what degree would be good complimentary? What do you wanna do? Pick what you wanna do. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I'll let Andy because he's got a bunch of degrees. Who was that? That's uh, Pat, Tell Pat, Pat Torres. 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 Yeah. So, Pat, it sounds. Did you go to Johnson and Wales? Because that's what it sounds like. Because that's where I graduated from. I got my associates in culinary and my bachelor's in nutrition. Um, I then went on to actually get my exercise and nutrition science degree from Dr. Wilson here <laughs> um, at the University of Tampa. So it really depends on your goal. I mean, with my background, I had food science, clinical dietetics. Um, I didn't have a lot of exercise experience, so that's why I went to get the master's degree. Um, however, 
kind of, it, it's really where you want to go. With that degree, you have a lot of options because I've been given a lot of options with that degree. Um, therefore, a lot of options. So I would recommend pick, pick where you want to go. You have a huge background. Therefore, you can really determine, I mean, your outcome. Yeah, advice. some people actually too. One of the things again, we're going back to internships and, and and living things. To be quite honest, right now there's a lot of even good online programs. The key is on that. <clears throat> some people actually come here. They've done their masters here while doing like online masters, but they're actually doing all their research here in the facility. To do that, you really want to find a good place to work in and get experience. I would put experience over the school any day. You could take a, a, a researcher, um, to be quite honest, and again, like, as far as science is concerned, you could take me and you put me in a garage and give me a squat rack. And if you ask me to publish really good quality studies, I would. It's not about the facility, it's about the person. It just so happens at ASBI, like, we have, we have the number one lab in the whole nation, period. Um, but we also have a lot of intellectual capital, like with Andy, with Paul, um, you know, with a lot of the guys who are in this facility. Uh, that's interesting. Exactly. How do you personally recharge spiritually? I that's mean, a lot for yourself is going outside. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge thing. I mean, you talk about mental, spiritual. How important is being positive? Well, I think being positive is huge, right? I for me, everything. yeah, I mean, I think prayer and, and, and everything like that's very, very important. You know, um, personally, me, the, I, I, it helps me to stay positive, you know, every single day. I think that's absolutely essential. Guys, there's a, listen, like, there's a lot of things out there, like, that if you listen to people, there's a lot of anger out there. And it's, it, it intrigues me. Um, <clears throat> people are sending me links to people who are hating on, like, low carb and calling people zealots and stuff earlier today. And, like, and he's like, what do you think about this? And I feel sorry for that person. Like, there's some spiritual things going on probably there. So, um, you know, for me, I do a lot of studies, do a lot of research. But there's some good books of wisdom that are, that are helpful for, like, that stuff, like Proverbs and stuff like that. But um, so it's very important to recharge. It's very important um, to address the spiritual component. It helps me a lot. It's very important to stay positive. You know, and, you know, set your values that you're trying to help people, right? Okay, uh, Near Ohion says, Hey, Doc, does time and retention influence the type of muscle fibers that are being used? If I do a set of eight reps uh, for 40 seconds, do I recruit the slow twitch fibers as well as the fast? Um, okay, here's the thing to understand. Um... Time under tension is a concept for how long a muscle fiber is under tension. I could take five pounds and keep a muscle under tension for 40 seconds, and it's five pounds. Think about that for a second, okay? I don't care how much intent I have. I might be able to recruit some fast switch fibers with five pounds. But there's going to be very little muscle damage when I'm doing that. Does that make sense? So... There's, div there's mechanics, there's load, and there's intent. All of them matter, right? So I think um, uh, basically like, you know, so I, I think time and retention is certainly important, but repetitions could dictate time and retention. So I could take a weight and lift it slowly for 40 seconds or I, and I only get eight reps, or I could lift that weight for 20 reps for 40 seconds. I would actually think you'd probably get more benefit of the 20 reps, to be quite honest. Uh, last, one more question. Last question. Um, okay. Simple. So, Doc, why do you give away so much information for free and not charge a premium on everything that you do? Um, I'm going to go back to my dad. Um, you know, heck, someone asked me a question about being spiritual and stuff like that. To me, it's a higher calling. To be quite honest with you, it's a higher calling. Like, it's, it's not about me. Um, for my dad, it wasn't about him. It's about changing as many lives as humanly possible. And that's why I give away so much information. So um, I love you guys. Um, see you guys next week. We'll talk about intermittent fasting. And share the love. I love